say the little efforts that I make will do no good. You say they never will prevail to tip the hovering scale when justice hangs in the balance. I never thought they would. But I'm prejudiced beyond debate in favor of my right to choose which side shall feel the stubborn ounces of my weight. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. The struggles of the civil rights movement of the 60s were well documented. The riveting images will never be forgotten. The passionate words of Martin Luther King have become a part of history. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, free at last. A dozen years before the March on Washington, there was another movement that was committed to the fight for equality and freedom. It grew out of the auto factories of Detroit, the packing houses of Chicago, and the sweat of black laborers across the country. The National Negro Labor Council was the forerunner of the civil rights movement that followed. And we just didn't, you know, take some mom and pop store or some little petty operation. We hit the big timers. So if you're going to have an impact, do it with a bang. We don't own any newspapers, but we own our face, ass, and bare fists. We are the people who do the work. The National Negro Labor Council was formed in 1951 and at one time claimed 5,000 members with 28 chapters in every major industrialized city in the country. Its mission was to advance blacks in the workplace and eliminate racism inside its own unions. This was considered a radical agenda during the Red Scare of the early 50s and members of the NNLC would eventually attract the attention of the FBI, the House on American Activities Committee, and the U.S. Attorney General. Why would the objectives of this organization be considered so dangerous? You would be hard pressed to find the answer to that question in any history book. The complete history of the National Negro Labor Council can only be found in the collective memory of its surviving members. At a reunion in Detroit, former members of the NNLC came from every part of the country to recall old battles and address new ones. Agency for International Development helped cut deals to move factories out of America. I ain't surprised, baby. Extraordinary men and women, many in their 70s, who spent a lifetime fighting economic racism, a fight this group began over 40 years ago. And I say that our message is current. We didn't come here to talk about forgotten glories. Our message is current. The measuring stick of democracy in any situation can be determined by the position of black people there. So when you pull up the bottom, you pull everything up. Whatever gains black workers made in industrial America during World War II were lost to a post-war recession. Job prospects for returning black veterans weren't much better. We were considered the enemy. Can you imagine that? Here we are, honorably, I'm an honorably discharged American veteran, you know. Been over there fighting fascism, man. Come back to this country and, uh, <laughs> and I'm still the, the, the damn enemy. Although blacks and whites marched together on union picket lines outside the plants, that is where racial solidarity ended. Inside, whites still had the best jobs. But the secret to uh, equal rights was equal economic opportunity. And equal economic opportunity meant equal access to jobs. You, you give a man a right to earn a living, give him an equal footing at the economic table, he can take care of the rest of it. And that was the base of our philosophy. We of the American labor movement are determined to remain free. The battle for equal opportunity was also directed at the white-dominated leadership of their own unions. They were willing to use us as organizers to get blacks to join a union. They were willing to take our dues dollar as members, but they were not willing to accept us in the leadership positions. Frustrated, 
angry, disillusioned, a group of progressive workers concluded the only way to fight for the rights of black workers was to form a national organization. The call went out across the country to come to Cincinnati for the first convention of the National Negro Labor Council. This is it. Meet in Cincinnati, October 1951. We didn't know how many people were going to appear. There was just no way. Vicki Garvin came from New York to the banks of the Ohio River to arrange for hotels and a place to meet. There are a lot of difficulties we face, especially because this was a period of McCarthyism and the anti-communist hysteria was just, just very high. And the trade unions advised their members not to attend or they would probably be kicked out of their jobs. The press was against us. The city council uh, in Cincinnati had a unanimous resolution that we were not welcome. Even other blacks denounced the NNLC. Lester Granger of the Urban League called the convention a masquerade party held for the benefit of communists. Of course, you know, they waved the red flag at us. And as I say, we, many of us didn't know communism from rheumatism. We knew a lot about unionism. <laughs> And that was the objective. That was objective. Because it was based on the very principles that this country was based on. Despite the intimidation, one black hotel, the Mance, opened its doors to the delegates. On October 27th, the first meeting of the National Negro Labor Council was called to order. We were sort of standing on the tiptoes of expectancy. <laughs> we loved it. Over 1,000 delegates representing 15 international unions came to Cincinnati. Dock workers, steel workers, auto workers, men and women, blacks and whites. The National Negro Labor Council was the first organization which fought on a principled basis for unity of black and white. And that was a lasting effect. Whites were invited to come to our meetings and be part of the organization, but the focus was on the condition of the blacks. The NNLC was one of the first organizations to fight to improve the working conditions of black women. I said, on this freedom train, there'll be twin seat driving, male and female. People came from every part of the country, from Harlem to Hollywood. Any organization that was fighting for, as we called it then, Negro rights, Negro jobs, I found a way into it. I had this friend who said, all we got to do is just meet it and greet it and defeat it. You can understand why I never want to be say, say, want to say that I'm an actress without adding activists. Resolutions were passed to support a National Fair Employment Practices Act, or FEPC. The Labor Council was determined to fight for jobs currently barred from black workers. It was one that will take me, will go with me to the grave uh, to see uh, so many black people from all parts of the country coming together and to see white people who are joining with them supporting us. I never, I haven't seen it since, to be frank with you. Before the NNLC left town, Paul Robeson came to offer his support and inspire the delegates with his music. This was at the height of his persecution, as you remember. His passport had been removed. They wouldn't let him sing in any of the concert halls. And Paul has had a tremendous record as a supporter of labor. The persecution that followed Robeson would soon come down full force on the men and women attending this convention. Ernest Big Train Thompson, a foundry worker and NNLC president, defined the two-day gathering with the words of W.E.B. Du Bois. Out of the darkness, out of the light, the black man crawls to the dawn of light, beaten by lashes, bound by chains, searching, seeking the freedom train. The 
discrimination was yours the day. And when there is a job shortage, we are the first to go. And especially if you are demanding conditions and wages. Inspired by the success of their founding convention, the National Negro Labor Council immediately began a campaign for jobs. The NNLC petitioned President Truman to fight for an effective fair employment law. They sent a delegation to Washington to lobby support for Senator Hubert Humphrey's FEPC bill, a bill that eventually died on the Senate floor. With little hope to improve the conditions of black workers by changing government policies, the NNLC took their fight to the streets. Their target, one of the largest retail chains in the country. Sears had a tremendous uh, trade with the black community all across the country. But the policy was that, no, they, they didn't hire none of us. We could spend our money with them, but you could not be one of our employees. You, we could walk in the Sears, and every time you walk into a place like that, at least every time I walk into a place like that, the, the, the inequities uh, slap me in the face. You have to be blind to go into a store and spend your money and see all white clerks, people handling the money and handling the goods, and blacks down on their knees scrubbing or in coveralls. That's what we saw. In December 1952, the NNLC announced it would picket Sears stores in 23 cities across the country. The council also sent a letter to board chairman Robert Wood here at the former Sears headquarters building in Chicago. The letter urged him to stop discriminatory hiring practices. This marked the beginning of a two-year battle against this giant retail outlet. The NNLC had some initial success at a Sears Roebuck store in Cleveland. At first, uh, the company was very arrogant. Mm -hmm. And um, after about uh, six weeks of picketing, where we had a uh, dramatic effect on, um, on uh, the volume of their uh, trade, both black and white. Blacks were hired in Cleveland and at other Sears stores across the country. But at their headquarters in Chicago, the struggle proved to be much tougher. You know, if you were to go into a Sears store like this in the early 1950s, what would you see? You would see no minority clerks and no minority managers. Chapman Wales was a labor council officer in Chicago. At that time, you could go downtown, and there was a big store stretching from Van Buren to Congress, no black clerks anywhere. So we took them on. We met with their executive. Uh, they had an office up on the uh, fifth or sixth floor at uh, State Street. And we went up and had a meeting with them. This was our first move. And uh, well, they drugged their feet. They didn't say yes and they didn't say no. And so we told them, well, if they didn't have any hired by a certain date, that we were going to put a picket line outside. So they didn't hire any. So then we put the picket line out there. The picket line worked, not only against Sears, but successful campaigns were launched to break down racial barriers in New York hotels, a San Francisco transit company, and packing house plants in Chicago. They took on organized baseball and banks in Detroit. The National Negro Labor Council was asking the Bank of the Commonwealth to hire a black teller, a black teller, you know. And you know, the police department come out and wanted to beat the hell out of us for putting a bank, a uh, picket line around the bank up here on Woodward and, and uh, Warren Avenue. Coleman Young took the NNLC case to the corporate offices. The first thing you know, say, you give, you give uh, colored, you know, Jobs are totally be wanting to marry white women. You know, I said, Mr. Parshaw, we came here for, for you know, a job, not a marriage license. You know, <laughs> during the Labor Council's second convention in Cleveland, the delegates staged a mass demonstration against American Airlines. We stopped traffic <laughs> because. Uh, that was the first time anything like that had happened in the city of Cleveland. We did raise the question, if our pilots can fly over Korea, <laughs> fly those planes, why can't they fly commercial planes? 
and all your stewardesses are doing is serving food. We've been cooking and serving white people all our lives. So we raised the consciousness of this kind of thing. And the victories came after we were gone. Nonviolent civil disobedience. It was a tactic used successfully by Martin Luther King and the NAACP. But the NMLC received very little support from mainstream civil rights organizations. The NAACP and many people who felt that we should sit down and let those who had the college degrees and the lawyer's degrees fight our battle for us in the courts. Well, we said uh, uh, good things come to those who wait, but here's one that's slicker. The guy who goes and gets what he wants gets it a little bit quicker. Critics believe the Labor Council was moving too quickly. Some of the most vocal opposition came from leaders of the union movement. Comes the largest local union in the world, Ford Local 600, 65,000 strong. Labor Day in Detroit. The solidarity in this march masked the history of dissension between Ford Local 600 and United Auto Workers President Walter Ruther. Nowhere across the country could you find another local in the UAW that had the progressive and the uh, understanding between black and white workers and also between black and white leaders. Ruther opposed putting a black representative on the UAW executive board and opposed the formation of the NNLC. Walter Ruther, uh, unfortunately, if you stepped on his toes, then it was no good. And he didn't feel a need for the council at all. He felt that we were trying to do the same thing as a union, which we were not. Still, the NNLC was perceived as being a front for the Communist Party. McCarthyism was on the rise. The union movement was under fire. Congress had already passed the Taft-Hartley Act requiring all union leaders to sign a loyalty oath. Ruther and others saw this as the Taft-Hartley Act as perhaps only the first step uh, in a broad-scale assault uh, on unions which would seize upon communist participation in the union as a pretext uh, to destroy the union movement. Communists in their drive for world domination have perfected the techniques of exploiting injustice and forging poverty into power. Walter Ruther was a vocal supporter of the anti-communist crusade and demonstrated his resolve by seizing control of the UAW's most radical local. NNLC members Dave Moore and Bernie Bellison were removed from office. It was like a bullet through me because we didn't have a trial, we didn't have anything. He just came in and removed us from office and called us communists and that was the end of it. You know, I think certainly Walter indulged in something that you could call red baiting. Uh, that is that uh, he saw this as an effective weapon uh, to use against those who were political opponents of his. The freedom train that roared out of Cincinnati was under attack. The Constitution says the freedom, right? To think and to, it doesn't always apply to us. <laughs> so when you open your mouth sometimes, you pay a price. When I wanted to direct, the producer said, Francis, we love you. You have more qualification than anyone on my staff, but you're black and you're a woman and I can't do a damn thing about you. The discrimination Frances Williams faced as an actress helped ignite her involvement in the Los Angeles branch of the NNLC. Like many members of the council, she was being watched and followed. They came to my house. And I told them that I had a list much longer than theirs. And if they would reckon with my list, maybe we could get together. In a series of dawn raids, FBI agents swooped down on communists. Suspected communists were being rounded up in Hollywood and New York. But the Red Scare extended to every part of the country. The FBI came after me with two, with two loaded barrels of guns, I guess. World War II veteran Jimmy Wright acknowledges he was a naive country boy from Kentucky. He had a rough time finding work in Louisville after the war. They didn't, they didn't even speak black. So when a black girl apply for a job, they don't job no black people. And they tell you. Rejection led to activism. Jimmy Wright became involved in the National Negro Labor Council in Louisville. One of the council's most important campaigns 
was to secure jobs for blacks in the massive new General Electric plant being built in Appliance Park. There was a move on the part of a major industry to move into the South. And we, were, we wanted to make sure that blacks were equally represented in the hiring. The campaign to win jobs at Appliance Park was quickly labeled a subversive plot. Jimmy Wright was tagged a communist. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. I, I came from down the sticks, down, down on the border of Kentucky. I didn't know what the hell the communist was, nothing else. I said, if that's what it is, I guess I'm one of them. If all of these these plans, and trying to get some respect for black people, that's what I am. Nowhere was the confrontation between the NNLC and the government more dramatic than in a federal courtroom in Detroit. You told us, uh, in giving us the background of your record of employment, uh, that you are now the executive secretary of the National Negro Labor Council. That's correct. They were accusing me and others, but since I was called me, of engaging in un-American activities. And I just didn't think that they had that right to question my, to, to charge what I was doing with being un-American, and I told this guy. Uh, do you consider the activities of the Communist Party as un-American? I consider the activities of this committee, as it cites people for reputedly being communists, just a moment. As an un-American activity. At one point, this committee was creating so much hysteria that for a person to be named by a stool pigeon before that committee as being a communist was enough to put that person's life in danger. Uh, you've told us that you were the executive secretary of the National Negro Congress. That word is Negro. You said Negro. I think you're mistaken. As a Negro, I resent the slurring of the name of my race. I mean, there ain't no mistaking that Negro, you know, is a bobtail nigger. I've seen it and heard it. In the face of the red storm, Coleman Young and other NNLC members were not about to give in without a fight. Are you now a member of the Communist Party? We dared them to try to take one name of one person and their address. He said, I'll cite you all for contempt of Congress. And I told him, I said, well, you and your ancestors from Georgia have not had anything but contempt for me from the first day you sailed that boat along the shores of Africa. I'm an ordinary working person, right? What? what who's afraid of me? For what? The United States government? For what? What can I do to? I've never held a gun in my hand in my life. I don't know what it feels to have a gun in my hand. So, afraid of me? Put people to follow me around? For what? I have presented to the committee a program, alternative program, you might put it, which to my mind will be very effective in destroying the communist movement in the United States. It provides for the immunity legislation. It provides new powers to the government to eliminate communist influence in labor and industry. In 1956, Attorney General Herbert Brownell labeled the NNLC a subversive organization. Every member would be required to register with the federal government or face criminal prosecution. It was decided that uh, we would dissolve the organization and that I would, that I would uh, assume a full responsibility for its death and all of its other business, and I burned a goddamn membership. And so when we disbanded, they just said, well, you don't have to register because you're non-existent. It was a very sad day when we had to say, we fought a good fight. We hope to fight another day. The day it disbanded, the NNLC released this statement. Our cause is still a just cause. Our effort was not and is not in vain. Our will and determination will push us on. 
Just what is the legacy of this organization only five years in existence? Members claim the council was one of the first organizations to take labor tactics such as demonstrations, boycotts, and picket lines and apply them to the civil rights struggle. And it worked. They understood the importance of strong, fair employment legislation long before Congress passed the Equal Opportunity Employment Act in 1964. And when the NNLC went to Louisville to fight for jobs, they foresaw how the migration of big industry from the North to the South threatened not only black labor, but the entire union movement. These were men and women who truly understood the words of Frederick Douglass. When there is no struggle, there is no progress. All in favor of the motion? Aye. A struggle these members believe continues to this day. Over 40 years have passed since the NNLC was born on a convention floor in Cincinnati. Still, these people feel a connection to each other, a common belief that discrimination can't be eliminated in society as long as inequality exists in the workplace. We didn't come here to talk about forgotten glories. Our message is current. During their reunion in Detroit, the White House announced it was withdrawing the nomination of Professor Lonnie Guineer as head of the Civil Rights Division for the Justice Department. She was considered to be too radical, a quota queen, critics charged. These warriors have felt the sting of the radical label before, and they were incensed it was still being used to erect roadblocks to qualified black appointees. They were incensed because they considered Lonnie Guineer family. Her father, Ewart Grenier, fought to break down racial barriers in New York. Ewart Grenier, a radical, a staunch believer in equal rights, an officer in the National Negro Labor Council. The torch has been passed to a new generation, but these people hope their work will be remembered. Tens of thousands of people have got jobs as a result of the uh, National Negro uh, uh, labor council activities. We were not the beginning, we are not the end. We dropped our pebble on the beach. We're gone but not forgotten. You can kill the dreamer, but you can't kill the dream. I've often wondered that as I lived militantly and uh, worked in this area, I often wondered what I'd feel like later in life and I don't regret one moment. <laughs>